السلام عليكم. It saddens me to see billions of people around the world today who believe in God while being divided between dozens of religions and belief systems. One of the major reasons for this division is the variety of the available holy scriptures, or let's say, the books claiming to be holy, the books claiming to be the word of God. Each group claims to be worshiping God based on what's written in their book, assuming of course that their book is correct and every other book is corrupt. Of course, we can't discuss all points of comparison between all claimed holy scriptures in one video. So today I will only focus on one point of comparison. The preservation. Because if a book is not proven to be preserved, then there is no point reading it and checking whether it's from God or not. If it is not preserved, you already know that whatever you are reading is man-made anyway. And even if it was from God in the beginning, what we're reading now does not represent the words of God. This is Dean Academy, and today in this video, we will be doing together a very intensive research about the preservation of the Quran, the preservation of the Hadith books, the preservation of the Old Testament, the preservation of the New Testament, and also, for fun, we will talk about the preservation of history. It will be a long video, but you should be patient with me. You know why? Because the evidence I will present to you now, it took months to collect, and if you're gonna collect it yourself, you will also take months. By the end of this video, you will have a very clear idea on which books can be trusted and which books can't. Get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. A couple of years ago, we heard some news that made us very sad. One of our favorite Quran reciters, who has been reading the Quran live on Quran FM radio every day for the past 25 years, got fired. I don't want to mention his name, but he spent 25 years reciting the Quran for us every day. Then he got fired because he made a mistake in one vowel while reciting. Imagine. One vow. Before you rush into saying, oh, that was harsh, you should give him another chance, these are the words of God. And they should be held to a very, very high standard. One mistake in one vowel in one verse is not acceptable and will never be. This is how Muslims value the preservation of the words of God. Or at least what they believe to be the words of God. When you ask a Muslim today, how sure are you that the Quran is exactly preserved word by word and letter by letter from the mouth of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, till today? He will tell you I am more confident in its preservation than my confidence in knowing my own name. Let me tell you why. See this brother from Ukraine? He is holding in his hand a certificate called Ijaza. This certificate is the secret that I want to reveal to you now. Not only him, by the way. This was last year's celebration for boys and girls who took the same certificate in one village in Giza, Egypt. All of those are just in one village in one year. And that picture was in the neighboring village in Ghamasa. Again, all of those boys and girls are in one small village in one year. And this is a similar celebration in a city in Algeria. Imagine that these celebrations are happening annually in every village and every city around the world. Every year, this certificate is issued to hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of boys and girls everywhere. The total number of holders of this certificate today who are alive is nearly 200 million. Wanna know how this certificate is the secret behind the preservation of the Quran? Of course, after the will of Allah. Let's read it together. I will translate for you. The certificate holder, this is his name, is now capable of reciting the full Quran from cover to cover from memory. All of it without making any mistake in any letter or vowel. And he was taught and tested by this teacher on this date. And this is the name of the teacher. And his teacher was taught and tested by his teacher on this date. And his teacher was taught and tested by his teacher on this date. 
and his teacher was taught and tested by his teacher on this date and so on and so on. Look at the names and the dates going back to the first teacher, Abil Qasim, Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him, who was taught the Quran by Angel Jibreel, who was taught the Quran by Allah. This certificate holds the full chain from Allah to the certificate holder with names and dates of everyone who taught and tested in the middle. And if during your test you made one mistake in the whole 600 pages of the Quran, you will not be granted the certificate. You made one mistake. You know what? Try again next year. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, taught the Quran to more than 100,000 companions. And those 100,000 taught millions of students. These millions of students traveled all over the world from east to west and taught tens of millions of students. A lot of them memorized the full Quran, while most of them at least memorized parts of it. Fast forward to today, and here we are still doing the same thing. The chain has not been broken. Now let's assume there were an evil man in the middle of this whole chain who wanted to corrupt a verse in the Quran. Imagine if one man claimed to be a sheikh, corrupted or added a verse or deleted a verse. What will happen is hundreds of millions of people would immediately cause this attempt to fail. This is called mass transmission and mass preservation. You know how blockchain currencies are very secure because a lot of people get a copy of the ledger? So even if one managed to hack one copy of all of these copies and make a change in it, it will immediately be corrected by the hundreds of other copies everywhere. Having a decentralized system made those currencies so secure. Imagine having hundreds of millions of people who memorized the full Quran cover to cover. Would anyone dare to make a change? Someone might say, what if every time the Quran was memorized by one of the students in this whole list of chain links, the student made one tiny mistake, just a small mistake. Then the next link, another tiny mistake. And then the next student, one tiny mistake. After hundreds of years, you will have a total of a lot of tiny mistakes which will add up to a big one. The final version that you will get will have at least a couple of mistakes in it, right? That is actually a fair question. So let me tell you why that concern doesn't apply to the Quran. You might think these people memorize the Quran just for the certificate. And when they finally get the certificate, that's it. They just ignore it for the rest of their lives. Like it was history, something that I've done when I was young. That is actually the exact opposite of what happens in reality. Muslims have to pray a minimum of five daily prayers. That is in addition to a lot of sunnah and the night prayer every day. The Quran is recited inside these prayers. It is a part of the daily, daily prayers that you do every day for the rest of your life. And by the way, these prayers are mostly done in groups. Groups of ten, groups of hundreds. Sometimes you see groups of thousands. If one makes a mistake in the prayer, a lot of people will immediately correct him. For example, here is an 8 years old boy correcting the Imam in prayer. Also besides prayers, Muslims are required to fully revise the Quran once every three days, or 10 or maximum 30 if you're really, really busy. That applies to all of their lives. So imagine yourself memorizing the full Quran and then revising it every three days, let's say 10 days, for the rest of your life. Tell me if the memory issue applies or not. Also, let me tell you how history proved this method to be absolutely perfect. You know that in history, unfortunately, unfortunately, Muslims got divided several times. In some of these times, they even fought each other. Sad, of course, 
but there is something that I need you to focus on. At that time of separation, people in the East completely, completely lost connection to the people in the West. Let's say Muslims in Indonesia lost connection to Muslims in Spain. Of course, that is not accurate, but as an example. There were no phones, no internet, different countries, different languages, very far away from each other and ruled by different rulers who didn't like each other. After hundreds of years of separation, you would expect if a mistake happened, for example in Indonesia, this mistake will not propagate to the other side of the world. So, when they unite back together, you will suddenly find two different versions of the Quran. Please focus on this. If you claim that memory is not reliable enough and can cause small mistakes over time, an Indonesian man who made a mistake will have no help from his brothers in Spain, right? No one will correct him. So, you should expect them to have at least one different verse after 1000 years according to your theory. But the reality is, when we check today the Quran in the Far East and compare it to the Quran in the Far West, we don't find one difference. Not even one difference in a letter, not even in a vowel. The historical division between the Muslims was sad, yes, but it is proof enough for the superiority of this preservation method. Finally, the manuscripts. This is the Birmingham Quran manuscript. Radiocarbon analysis dated the parchment on which the text is written to the period between 558 and 645 AD. The test was carried out in a laboratory at the University of Oxford. The result places the leaves close to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, who lived between 570 and 632 AD. And as expected, when we compare the Quran memorized, memorized in the hearts of Muslims in the Far East with the Quran memorized in the hearts of Muslims in the Far West with the Quran in the manuscript, all of them, all of them are exactly the same. This is another codex. It also dates to the 7th century. And this is the Sana'a script. It also dates to the 7th century. And this is the Tubingen fragment, also dates to the 7th century. And these are several other examples. All of these manuscripts in museums around the world are all radiocarbon dated to extremely, extremely early dates. And all of them are exactly the Quran that we read today. All of them are exactly the Quran that was preserved by memorization of hundreds of millions of boys and girls around the world. Every professional on earth agrees, even atheist historians agree, that this book has not been changed, not even one letter. Allah said in Surah An-Nahl, We have sent the Quran down to you, O Prophet, so you may explain to people what has been revealed to them. Allah assigned the job of explaining the Quran to us, to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. And the Prophet did. He gave lessons after lessons after lessons, explaining every detail about our religion, the way God ordered him. These explanations along with the Prophet's practical application of his teachings are what we call now Hadith books. Hadith is a word in Arabic that translates to speech. Hadith books are not like the Quran. Hadith books contain a collection of eyewitness reports of historical speeches from the life of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and his companions. And this collection is the only way we can understand the Quran and learn how to apply it to our lives. Because the companions of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, understood how important these speeches are, they almost recorded all of the Prophet's life events in extreme detail. When you read the Hadith books today, you feel like you are watching the Prophet's life on a video stream, minute by minute. Starting with his public lessons to every minor detail in his life. From how to perform worship to which side of the bed did he sleep on. From national laws to the way he drank water. 
from dealing with his enemies to every time he smiled, from sending letters to the Roman and Persian emperors to how did he treat his wife at home. Everything that you need to know and much more. And because the eyewitnesses who lived with the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and narrated about this were more than 100,000 companions, we had to develop a way to read their narrations from the least trustable testimony to the most trustable. So early scholars came up with a brilliant history authentication science or what we call Rijal, the science of men. Before we take a testimony from a man, we should know his biography, right? He should be a righteous Muslim. He should be known to be trustworthy. We should ask his community about him. What did his neighbors say about him? What did his family say about him? Was he a good person when he was buying and selling? All of that. And by the way, in the past, unlike today, people had very strong communities and everyone knew each other. So when I say this man in the chain of narrators was known to be trustworthy, If I say this man was praised by his community, that was real, as it was nearly impossible to fake piety at that time, simply because if one person did something bad, the whole community would know about it. Again, everyone knew each other. People were close. I know this is science fiction today, but you know, you will have to imagine normal society before before Facebook at least. They took this criteria very strictly. For example, if someone was reported to be seen harsh with animals, his testimony in hadith would not be accepted. Imagine to that extent. Also, the narrator shouldn't be a kid and shouldn't be an old man because, you know, he might get confused and say an extra word or something. This is a big responsibility. He should be known to have a strong memory and the interest in memorizing hadith. Otherwise, his testimony would not be accepted. Someone might be known for his strong memory, but he didn't decide to memorize hadith. Therefore, we wouldn't accept his testimony. They would even test his memory by asking him about narrations that they already authenticated. But, you know, purposely make a mistake in one of them to see if he would correct them or not. And even if he passed all of these tests, he still needs to prove that he witnessed the reported event with his eyes, not heard it from someone. Because if he heard it from someone, then in order for us to accept this narration, we will have to go to this someone and redo the whole testing system from the beginning on this someone. Full biography, make sure he is a righteous Muslim, trustworthy, good age, clean slate, tested strong memory, interested in memorization, and I witnessed the event. If he heard it from someone, then we will have to redo the whole process even one more time. Full biography, righteousness, Muslim, trustworthy, good age, clean slate, tested strong memory, interested in memorization, and I witness, and so on. This is called the chain of narrators. Some people call it anana. All the men in the chain should fulfill all of these rules. And that is only one chain. But the hadith are not only reported by one chain. For example, one day the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ If anyone fabricates a lie about me, he will be in hellfire. This hadith is narrated by 72 companions. All of them fulfilled all of the previous rules. And those 72 companions taught all of their students and the number of students was overwhelmingly high. For example, one company, Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira alone had more than 800 students. So this specific hadith that I mentioned can be found in a huge number of chains of narrators going back to the 72 companions who were direct eyewitnesses to it. The rule applies to all of them. We know all of their life stories and how trusted each one of them is. And most importantly, all of them believed in this hadith they are narrating. If anyone fabricates a lie about me, he will be in hellfire. By the way, whether you believe in this hadith or not, it doesn't matter. Because this is what they believed. What you believe is not our point now. 
So if all of them believed that anyone who fabricates a lie about the Prophet will be in hellfire, they wouldn't risk fabricating a lie about the Prophet for no reason. And even if one of them was so brilliant and deceived everyone and proved to everyone that he's trustworthy and fabricated this hadith, what about the others? You cannot expect thousands of people from different countries, different ethnicities, different interests, all of them to come together in one big meeting in a big room and sit there and plot and plan and agree to fabricate one hadith. That would be a very, very stupid assumption. And finally, when we have a hadith that was narrated by, let's say, 20 people, 19 of them said the exact same thing, but one added an extra word. The scholars would regard this extra word as an irregularity, and they wouldn't accept it from him anyway. This is the highest level of authentication anyone can hope for in any history book around the world till today. Major history books don't even have 10% of this authentication process, and we will talk about that at the end of the video. What I give you now is one example of a well-trusted hadith. Now, let me give you an example from the other side of the spectrum. Let's read one together. The love of this worldly life is the motivation for every sin. When we applied the same rules to test the chain of narrators of this hadith, the chain actually ended to one of the early Muslims and did not end to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him himself. Therefore, we say we are not sure whether the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said it himself, or was this just the opinion of the early Muslim? Both possibilities work, and there is no way to validate. Every sentence in those Islamic history books is graded with the same scientific method. Every sentence in these hundreds of thousands of pages in hadith books has a grade next to it. You will find grades like Sahih, Hasan, Da'if, Mawdu' and others. I don't want to go into details, but it is not either black or white, authentic or fabricated. It is a spectrum that starts with no evidence to 100% evidence and everything in between. I hope the idea is clear now. And regarding those Islamophobes who claim that the hadith was written after the death of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, they lie to people. In their videos, they refer to this hadith. We asked the Prophet's permission to write his speech, but he didn't give us permission. They read only this part. But they purposely don't complete until the end of the page. Because if they just open the same page and scroll down a little bit, they will find the Prophet himself ordering them to write his speeches. Like, for example, this part and this part. At least there were 52 companions who wrote the teachings of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, while he was still alive. Like, for example, Abi Shah al Yemeni, Amr ibn Hazm, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al Has, Anas ibn Malik, and many others. This is Abu Huraira saying, The only one who memorized the hadith more than me was Abdullah ibn Amr. Because he was memorizing and writing, while I was only memorizing without writing. This narration is graded authentic, by the way. Sahih. And these are more examples of writings from the life of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, himself. That is in addition to the huge number of books written after his death. Like Kathir ibn Murrah, for example, the direct student of Umar ibn al-Khattab, also Abu Bakr ibn Hazm, and Ibn Shihab al-Zuhari. People like al-Bukhari and the Muslim only collected, organized, and authenticated these narrations that were already there from the beginning. They authenticated the narrations that were written earlier. And for those who ask about manuscripts, just go to the Islamic Manuscript House website and take a tour there. Take your time. You will be amazed. If you're going to this website, expecting to find one or two manuscripts for every book, you couldn't be more wrong. Let me give you one example to help set up your expectations. 
let's say السيرة النبوية لابن هشام. You will find 177 ancient copies of this book. 22 copies in Egypt, 8 in Saudi Arabia, 50 in Turkey, 52 in Europe, and more. Do your research and you will find the abundance of complete manuscripts of every hadith book. I want to finish this chapter with one final interesting topic. According to At-Tabari, Umar ibn al-Khattab was killed four days before the end of Zul Hajjah, in the Hijri year 23. And according to as suyuti there was a solar eclipse when Umar died. Some scientists thought this was an interesting fact to validate, you know, if they are looking for a mistake. So they made an astronomical investigation. And turns out that exactly on this specific day, 5 of November, the year 644, there was a solar eclipse and it could be seen from the city of Medina itself. Think about that. Before we talk about the preservation of the Bible, let me please remind you quickly of the guidelines that we used to authenticate every hadith narration. If someone came and claimed that he heard the Prophet say something, he will have to go through these guidelines in order. Number one, direct contact. He should be an eyewitness himself, or he should at least provide his direct, full relationship with the eyewitness. Number two, trustworthiness. We should have his complete biography and his reputation within his community. He should be known to be a righteous, trustworthy believer, right? Number three, memory. He should pass several tests to check his ability and willingness to memorize. He also shouldn't be a kid or an old man. Number four, similarity with other chains. If the same event was reported by several chains of narrators, they should all report the same thing, right? They shouldn't contradict each other or differ. If it passes all of these tests, then we check the hadith itself, see if it complies with the Quran, complies with other narrations, and then we accept it. Now let's apply the same rules the same guidelines, but to the Bible. Let's start with the Old Testament. Something like Deuteronomy, for example. It is claimed to be written by Moses, right? Obviously, we don't have the tablets of Moses physically, right? And also, we don't have direct contact with Moses himself. We can't just talk to him now and ask him about its validity. So, we will have to rely on the middleman. The man in the middle claiming to write on behalf of Moses. Should we trust this man or not? So, let's apply the same guidelines on this man. Number one, direct contact. This man who wrote the Old Testament, did he have a direct contact with Moses himself or not? Let's ask our Christian friends, what is the earliest manuscript of the Old Testament? And when was it is radiocarbon date? They will say the Aleppo Codex, this codex that you can see. This is the earliest known Hebrew manuscript that compromises the full text of the Old Testament. Guess when it was written. For real, guess. Pause the video and write down your guess in the comments first before I say it. It was written in the year 920. 920 CE, not BCE. It was written after the revelation of the Quran. Imagine. Think about this, please. Prophet Moses lived approximately 1400 years before Common Era. Someone wrote this book, the Old Testament, claiming it was written by Moses in the year 900 Common Era. If you count the number of years in the middle between both dates, you will add 1400 years before Jesus and 900 years after Jesus. That is a total of 2300 years difference. 2300 years between the life of Prophet Moses and the guy writing on his behalf. Please think about this. This is exactly like if I write now, take a piece of paper and write a letter claiming it was written by Alexander the Great himself. 
Will you believe me if I make that claim? Will you? You know what? Let me do it. I will get a piece of paper and I will write down something. Check this out. I don't know if you can see it or not. Hello guys, this is Alexander. Do you know how great I am? I am claiming now that this text was written by Alexander the Great himself. What? You don't believe me? Why not? You should believe me. I, I am telling you, Alexander the Great wrote this. He, he time traveled 2000 years in the future, took this pen and wrote it himself. You know what? Okay, I'm not going to claim he wrote it himself. He, he said it to me directly face to face and uh, I wrote on his behalf. I'm not lying. Do you believe me? Do you know what is even more funny? The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They celebrated because turns out that the Dead Sea Scrolls date back to the 3rd century BCE. The gap now between the earliest manuscript and Moses is 1000 years only instead of 2400 years. That is amazing, right? Only 1000 years difference. So instead of claiming that Moses took a time machine to the future 2000 years, he only took a time machine to the future 1,000 years. See? It makes more sense now. You should believe it now. But 1,000 years is like me writing now on a piece of paper something and claiming it was written by Harun al-Rashid. Should I, should I get the paper and see if you're gonna believe me or not? You know what? This is not even the funniest part. The funniest part was that they didn't even like what was written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they ended up rejecting it and calling it uh, a heresy, like written by a heretic group. Because according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are actually more than one god. There is a big god, he is called El, and he has four children. One of his children is called Yahweh. So you have the father god, which is El, and he has four children. One of them is Yahweh. Yahweh is the god of Moses. So even the god of Moses is not the big god, he's the mini god. So in the end, they made the decision to claim that the earlier, the earlier manuscript is wrong. And then later manuscript that was written 2300 years after Moses is the correct one. If we just go scientifically here, like, you know, without the religious claims, we would say, we would assume normally that the earlier is more authentic, right? Like, as any historian who is studying anything in history would assume that the earlier is more authentic and the later version is the corrupt one. So the earlier manuscript says there is five gods, but the later one, after a thousand and something years, is saying one god after the revelation of the Quran. Again, Dead Sea Scrolls dated to 300 BCE, five gods. Then, Aleppo Codex dated to 920 CE, one god only. Can a professional, unbiased person please tell me what does that mean? Anyway, how many gods is not our point now, I don't care. The main question is, based on what did you claim that the Old Testament has anything to do with Prophet Moses, peace and blessing be upon him? Is there any connection? Can I declare an utter failure for the Old Testament, at least in the first guideline? Remember, direct contact. There is no direct contact whatsoever. So, you know what? Let's just skip to the second guideline. Anyone remembers the second guideline? Yeah, trustworthiness of the reporter. We need to know if the one claiming to be an eyewitness or the one reporting an event or a book or whatever, we need to know if we can trust him or not. Is he a righteous man, a good man, known to never lie or sin? Or is he known to be deceitful and sinner? But oops, we have actually no idea who wrote it. Basically, it was a piece of paper that they found buried underground somewhere next to the Dead Sea. So who wrote it? No idea. What is his biography? No idea. What did people say about him? No idea. Is he trustworthy or not? No idea. But you know what? 
We don't know the author himself, but we know which group of people he belonged to, right? So we can check whether these people were known to be righteous and trustworthy or not. And you know what? I'm setting the bar very low. If all of them were known to be righteous, I will assume he was righteous too. Deal? You know which group of people I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I'm sure you know them. They are the same chosen people that I can't mention their name here in the video to avoid, you know, getting automatically banned because freedom of speech. Anyway, the only way we know if a man is trustworthy or not is to ask his neighbors or his people about him, right? So we will apply the same criteria. We will read about them from their writings. Let's start by the book of Matthew. Matthew 23. You testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. Killers of the prophets, they don't seem really righteous and trustworthy to me. But you know what? That is not fair. Because this group of people don't even believe in the New Testament. So, to be fair, let's read about them from their own book that they claim to be holy. Isaiah 1 Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. The Lord says, the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Isaiah 30 Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine. For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instructions. They say to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. You know, prophesy illusion. Leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One. They tell the prophets, stop preaching about God. Tell us nice things instead. You know, talk to us about getting drunk and doing adultery. Stop confronting us with God. Stop talking about righteousness. These are their testimony against themselves. So, the question is to you now. Are these people trustworthy enough to base your hereafter, the most important thing in your life, your paradise or hell, you will base your hereafter on their word when they claim that Moses time traveled 2,300 years in the future, wrote a book, and then went back. You know what? They even actually admit fabricating text and claiming it's from God. I'm not joking. Jeremiah 8.8 8. These are all the available translations. Choose whatever you want and read it. How can we say we are wise? For we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. Try this translation. How can we say we are wise because we have the words of the Lord when your teachers have twisted it by writing lies? Why do you turn a blind eye to all of this? Why do you pretend to be okay with all of that? Teachers have twisted it by writing lies. You're okay with this? Anyway, let's apply the third guideline, the memory test. Can we actually get this author and test his memory? We don't even know who he is, so that's a fail, right? Just skip to the fourth one. Similarity with other chains. The same event reported by a lot of chains should say the same thing, they shouldn't contradict, but we have a problem. We have one copy, which is the earliest one, huh? it says five gods, and the new version, which was written after the revelation of the Quran, says one god only. So which one of them is correct? And that's not the only issue. The Ethiopians, they claim to have the original Torah, which is different than the one in the King James Bible. Let me give you an example. Ethiopians claim the divinity of Isra. See the word apotheosis here? It means elevation to divine status. So, someone please tell me, is Isra divine or not? Maybe the Ethiopian copy of the Old Testament is the correct one. 
or maybe the five gods one is the correct one or maybe the king james one is the correct one or maybe none of them who knows also there are these Sumerians in Nablus who claim to be the real children of Israel have you heard about them so which of all of these contradicting accounts is the correct one or maybe none of them also what about the hundreds of contradictions within the same version next month inshallah i will have a video that shows in details more than 100 mistakes and contradictions in the bible old and new testament subscribe so you won't miss it but for now we have to declare an utter failure for the old testament in all the authentication guidelines for validating historical reports all of them it didn't even pass one guideline maimonides is a jewish arab from spain he laments the death of Hebrew. So Hebrew died harder than Latin died. I can learn Latin. I can learn the vocabulary. I can learn the grammar. And I can have a conversation with you. When Hebrew died, they lost a lot of vocabulary. And they lost the grammar system. They kind of vaguely knew what the grammar system ought to look like because they had holy texts. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to reconstruct the language. It wasn't enough to learn it and speak it. So here's what Maimonides did. He realized that Hebrew and Arabic were very close cousins, maybe brother and sister actually. So he took Arabic grammar, he studied it until he understood it. He took Arabic grammar, he took, he took the Hebrew vocabulary that they had from the holy text, he plugged it in, and then whenever he was missing a word, he just grabbed the Arabic word and stuck it in. And he brought Hebrew back which is unbelievable. Now we can say with confidence that the authenticity rating for this text is no more than 0%. Before we talk about the preservation of the New Testament, I want you to imagine our Salaf scholars sitting there testing the memory skills of every narrator. Getting his full life story, making sure he is a trustworthy, righteous person, and making sure he was a direct eyewitness to the event, or at least knows the direct eyewitness to the event. Then suddenly, while they were doing these tests, the assistant came into the room and said, there is one Indian guy outside claiming to have hundreds of speeches from the Prophet's life, peace and blessing be upon him. And he has all of them written down. They let them in. Then the Indian guy gave them a book written in the Indian language. The scholars were surprised. Who wrote this book? He said, an Indian guy wrote it. He is a friend of mine. They said, where did he get all of this hadith from? Why is this book in Hindi? The Prophet spoke Arabic and all of his companions who witnessed him were Arabs. How come a random Indian guy witnessed all of that? Who is this friend of yours? And what is his life story? And how do we make sure that he is a trustworthy person? Did he ever even meet the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him? Anyway, he has no answers. So they got angry and asked him, why should we believe you? This Indian guy finally said, You should believe me because I decided that this hadith book is the only correct one and everything else that you have is a heresy. You should believe me because I said so. Do you think he sounds silly? Well, I do. But unfortunately, billions of Christians would disagree. Billions of Christians don't see this as a silly story. Let me tell you how. After the life of Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, people in this whole area that you can see on the map taught each other his teachings, his wisdom, everything they knew about him. These were the early followers of Jesus, who were and are until now the only source of information for us about him. A lot of them wrote what they learned about Jesus in different manuscripts that we possess today. The problem is, 
manuscripts that were found in Egypt were written in the ancient Coptic Egyptian language, while on the other side, there were manuscripts written in Greek, but Jesus neither spoke Coptic nor Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic, and that is the first similarity with the story of the Indian guy claiming to hear from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. A guy from India claiming to write on the behalf of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, is exactly like a guy from Egypt claiming to write on behalf of Prophet Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, in Egyptian Coptic language. The same applies to Greek. Moreover, when you ask a layman Christian, when were these manuscripts written? He might tell you they were written after 50 years from Jesus. He might say 100 years from Jesus. It depends on like whether it's Matthew or John or whatever. This is what they tell him in the church. But this was proven to be absolutely wrong. Scientifically, at least. This claim is a lie. This is Codex Sinaiticus. This is the earliest, earliest, listen to me, earliest manuscript of the New Testament. It is radiocarbon dated to the 4th century. That is 400 years after Jesus. 400 years, not 50. 400 years, not 100. That is the difference between scientific evidence and the claims of the preachers. And by the way, it was found buried somewhere in a mountain in Sinai, Egypt. Hence the name Sinaiticus. Basically, this random paper that was found buried somewhere, written by someone that we don't even know, in a different language that Jesus didn't speak, after 400 years of his life, claims to be the words of God, or the words of Jesus, or the words of eyewitness at least. But none of these claims make any sense. How is that different from the Indian guy claiming to know Hadith? Moreover, if you think that this was the only manuscript found in Egypt, you are way off. We actually found a huge library of manuscripts filled with Gospels talking about Jesus in Naga Hammadi, Egypt. This is the list of the books found. And the funny part is, these books are dated earlier than Codex Sinaiticus. So, they are earlier, therefore they are more authentic. But the problem is, they say the exact opposite of what Codex Sinaiticus claim. In this case, you would assume that the earlier is more authentic, right? But no, this is not Christian logic. According to Christian logic, the later is better. Remember in the Old Testament when the earlier manuscript says that there is five gods and the newer one said there is one, they take the newer one, right? The same happened here. They claim that the earlier codexes were wrong, and the later ones are more accurate. Earlier data codexes, like for example the Gospel of Peter, says Jesus was not tortured nor crucified. That happened to someone else. But later dated manuscripts say Jesus was tortured and crucified. So which one should we believe, the early or the late one? Earlier dated codexes, like the book of Sitt al-Akbar says, Jesus was saved by God. God raised him to heaven and they executed another man. But later ones that were written 400 years after Jesus says that Jesus was tortured and crucified. Earlier dated codexes like A'mal Yohanna say, no harm has fallen upon Jesus. But later dated manuscripts say Jesus was tortured and crucified. According to Christian logic, they always go with what was written later. They did it with the Dead Sea Scrolls and they did it with the New Testament. The question is, how are you choosing what is right and what is wrong? Are you just choosing what you like? Are you choosing what you want to choose? Or is there a criteria? Because if there is a criteria, please tell us. What about this huge list of manuscripts? Why did you decide suddenly that all of them are wrong? Based on what? What about the Gospel of Thomas? What about the Gospel of Peter? What about the Gospel of Mary? What about the Gospel of Judas? 
What about the 50 Gospels that the church suddenly decided, nah, we don't like them? What's wrong with them? And again, what is the criteria? How do you choose? Do you just choose what you like and reject what you don't like? And why are Christians okay with that? Why do you trust these people who are choosing for you? Let me choose a religion for you. Because they are basically choosing a religion for you. They chose your religion. They chose what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe. And who wrote all of these random contradicting texts? And why do they contradict each other? And what is so special about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that doesn't exist in the other Gospels? Why are there only four accepted out of 50? And even these four Gospels that they chose out of 50, they even contradict each other in a lot of instances. I will talk about that in the next video, I promised you. Also, who wrote these four Gospels? And what is the proof that these are the real authors? The manuscript itself is dated to the 4th century, and preachers claim that it was written by eyewitnesses. Did the eyewitness live 400 years? These people don't die. They witnessed Jesus as eyewitnesses and then wrote this scripture 400 years later in a different language. How long did people live back then, 2000 years ago? Do you have any proof about anything? Or do you just believe what you want to believe? Even Christian scholars now agree that John was not written by John. Matthew was not written by Matthew. But they still believe it anyway. I'm not joking. The same scholar says, I agree, yes, the author is unknown. We don't know who wrote that. But you know what? I believe it anyway. Subhanallah. This is in the Christian study Bible. Okay? So this is an apologetic. This is not a Muslim book or any of that kind of stuff. The chapter called Hebrews. What does it say? Who wrote it? The author of Hebrews is unknown. They're admitting they don't know who wrote they it. They don't even know who wrote it. Right. How do you know it wasn't a, a rapist, a murderer? You know what I mean? Right? You don't even know who wrote it. Right? Even the famous gospels, you will find that their authorship is unknown. Right? Almost nothing is known about this person instead of our indulging in speculation. It is crucial for us to remember that both Luke and Acts are anonymous narratives, as all are of the Gospels. They make no claim with regard to their authorship, nor do they identify with any of the authors. You guys can go read it yourself. It's by a Christian, pastor, PhD. What about the Aryan Christians? What's wrong with them? You are claiming they are wrong. Okay, no problem. But they are claiming you are wrong. And I am outside here. If you say they are wrong, they say you are wrong. Who should I believe? And the question is to both sides, by the way. When they claim that you are a heresy, what is their proof? And when you claim they are a heresy, what is their proof? Or do both sides just believe whatever they want to believe? Is there a criteria? The writings of the two second century church leaders, Papias and Irenaeus, both seem to agree that the gospel according to Matthew was originally written in the Hebrew language. A gospel in Hebrew makes a lot more sense. Yes, Hebrew, I would take that. But where is it? Where is the original Matthew? Show me the manuscript of Matthew that was written in Hebrew. And how are you sure that the paper that you found buried somewhere 400 years later is exactly the same word by word to the original Matthew that was written at the life of Jesus? The Hebrew one. It wasn't even written at the life of Jesus. It was written after it. But anyway, at least it is early. It is close. 400 years is a lot of time. Do you know what happened 400 years ago? Was it? I think 400 years ago there was no USA. Or was it? I'm not sure actually, just google it and see. But 400 years is a lot of time. So for someone to write something and then claim that he is an eyewitness 400 years later, that's a stretch. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark, or according to Mark, apparently we have two different Gospels of Mark that contradict each other. In the manuscripts, by the way, I'm talking about the manuscripts, not the translation. We have one with a long ending and one with a short ending that is completely different. Read with me. Alternate endings. This is 
the long ending and this is the short ending. The earliest complete manuscript of Mark, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, two fourth century manuscripts, do not contain the last 12 verses, nor the unversed shorter ending. So, <laughs> I don't know what to say. If it doesn't exist in the earliest manuscript, and you claim that this earliest manuscript is your proof, then where do you get these verses from? Who wrote it and why? One of the most puzzling parts of Mark's gospel is the ending because it, it ends so abruptly. Um, in our earliest manuscripts, the gospel ends in verse eight, which says that the women were terrified, were frightened, and they had heard the announcement of the resurrection, but they said nothing to anyone. That's a very strange way to end the gospel. Uh, there is a longer ending, verses nine through 20, but it's clearly not written in Mark's style. It's different vocabulary, different style, different theology. Almost certainly Mark didn't write those last 10 or so verses, verses 9 to 20. It also states that true Christians can drink poison, Matthew, Mark chapter 16, and not be harmed. Uh, as far as the Mark, that comes from uh, the end of Mark, which practically every scholar, uh, every Bible scholar in, in the world says was not authentic, um, that this was a later edition. Remember when I said in the beginning of the video, if one man tried to change one letter in the Quran, 200 million people will immediately correct him. The problem with the history of the Bible is it was exclusive to the church. Christians were forbidden their access to their own book. That means that if one corrupt pope somewhere, God forbids, decided to add a verse or remove a verse or whatever in the Bible, no one would know. No one would ever argue with him. He has the only copy. Read this article by Professor Bernard Starr from the University of New York. Why Christians were denied access to their Bible for 1,000 years. Take a screenshot of it and read it on your own. He also talks about how various churches and officials adopted different texts and gospels. It will open your eyes to a lot of lies your preachers are telling you. I will give you another example. Open the book 1 John 5, go to verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. See, this verse describes how God is three in one very clearly, right? But when you open the same verse, but from another manuscript, the one that was translated in the NIV, it reads as follows. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. What? Is it Spirit, water, and blood in agreement, or is it Father, Word, and Holy Ghost are one? That is completely different. Both can't be correct. One of them, at least, should be a forgery. Maybe both, but let's say one of them is a forgery. To determine which one is a forgery, you go to the manuscripts that they translated from. Which one is the earliest one? According to the footnote in the Bible itself, that's not my opinion, they wrote it. This Father, Word, Holy Ghost part was found in no Greek manuscript before the 15th or the 16th century and in no early version. The Bible scholars here uh, wrote, uh, wrote the following. Late manuscripts of the Vulgate testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that testify on earth, are not found in any Greek manuscript before the 16th century. We can see the reason why those words are of concern. It clarifies that those words were not found in any Greek manuscript before the 16th century. The perpetrators of the Trinitarian doctrine, they succeeded in doing what? Inserting or adding words into the King James Bible version that were not in the original manuscripts, which is a clear violation of God's prohibition to add to his words. Their attempt to include a mention of the Father, the Word, and 
the uh, Holy Spirit, which uh, Miguel even inserted the word Jesus in there and put his parentheses there and insertion, they're not contained in the verse. When they add that and insert such, it is deceptive. Imagine that you are holding a book and calling it the words of God, knowing for a fact, for a fact, that people throughout history inserted verses into it. Imagine that the book itself is admitting it was corrupted while still saying it's God's words. And of course, don't forget the Christian logic. The later is better, remember? Most Christians that I talk to, at least, claim that the King James Version is the best version out there. But it has a fresh new verse that was added in the 16th century. And this book that has an extra verse is more trusted than the older ones. So where did the Father, the Word and the Spirit go? They were not in Erasmus's primary manuscript or in any of the others that he consulted. And so naturally, he left them out of his first edition of the Greek text, as a good scholar would do, because there's no evidence that this verse is in the Greek manuscripts. More than anything else, it is this, this leaving out of this verse that outraged Christian theologians of his day, who accused Erasmus of tampering with the text in an attempt to eliminate the doctrine of the Trinity, and to devalue its corollary, the doctrine of the full divinity of Christ. As the story goes, Erasmus, possibly in an unguarded moment, agreed that he would insert the verse in a future edition of his Greek New Testament on one condition, that his opponents produce a Greek manuscript in which the verse could be found. Finding it in Latin manuscripts was not enough. There were late medieval manuscripts that had it. And so a Greek manuscript was produced. In fact, it was produced for the occasion. It appears that someone copied out the Greek text of the epistles. And when he came to the passage in question, he translated the Latin, Greek, Latin text into Greek, giving the Johannine comma in its familiar, theologically useful form. The manuscript provided to Erasmus, in other words, was a 16th century production made to order. So Erasmus demanded, I want to see this in a Greek manuscript. And his opponents say, OK, and they went away and they made one, <laughs> literally made one up in the 16th century in Erasmus's day, wrote it out, included the verse, the Johannine comma about the Trinity, stuck it in and gave it to him. Say, there you are. There, there's your Greek manuscript. Go ahead and produce your uh, your good critical scholarly text. Seems like in the 16th century, they were being attacked a lot because, you know, the idea of the Trinity doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And it doesn't exist in the Bible. So people were saying, why do you claim that God is three in one, even though the Bible doesn't say so? So they said, you know what? Enough headache. Let's shove in a verse there and make this verse our proof in the future. So they fabricated a verse that says that God is three in one and just put it there. And please ask those apologists to stop saying, ah, it was an honest mistake, just translation mistake. You can't honestly mistake water for father. You can't honestly mistake blood for Jesus. And you can't honestly mistake agreement for one. Clearly, it was purposely forged. Here on Bible Gateway, they say it was not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. See, they are saying it was forged in the year 1400 after Jesus, not in the year 1600 after Jesus. That is much better. Howdy, y'all. And a lot of people have been telling me, hey, man, the Bible's been changed. There's stuff missing from it. And I said, nah, you joking. Well, they said Matthew 17 verse 21 ain't there in the Bible anymore. Someone took it out. I said, you full of it. So come over here. Come over here and take a look. This is Matthew 17. And we're going to go 19. There's 20 because your little faith. Okay. It's got to be right after that. Verse 21. Verse 22. There's no 21. So I told myself, let's go get an old Bible. Get an old 1800s Bible. Matthew 17, 21. What do you know? Here's chapter 17. Verse 21, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. 
So somebody changed the Bible, and then I found out there's tons of verses that have been changed and are missing and are added to the Bible. How can we trust this book? Moreover, the Protestant's Bible has 66 books inside. Okay, but the Catholic's Bible has 73 books. What's wrong with those extra seven books? Did they just remove them because they didn't like them? What is the criteria? They just removed seven books randomly? You know what? The Orthodox Bible has 81 books. So what about these extra 15 books? Do they just sit there and say, Hmm, I like this book. Let me claim its words of God. But I don't like this one. I will pretend it is a heresy. Based on what? Because if that is the case, just random guy sitting there choosing the words of God for you, this guy, I accuse him of being single for a very, very long time. Like literally, he was single for 3-4 years at least. Let me tell you why. Look at the words of God he chose for you. Song of Songs number 7 Your stature is like that of the palm, and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm. Seems like he's describing a woman that is very tall because your body is like a palm tree and your, you know, is like the clusters of fruit in the palm tree. I said, I will climb the palm tree. We know what is a palm tree, right? And I will hold of its fruits. Remember what is the fruits? May your breasts be like the cluster of grapes on the vine. The guy who was choosing the words of God for you, when he read this book, he said, yes, this is the words of God, I like it. From now on, it will be in the Bible. Moreover, the four Gospels that the Christian preachers claim to be the words of God, when you read them, you discover that the authors themselves didn't even make that claim. The Gospel itself, from beginning to end, didn't claim to be the words of God. So if the author didn't make the claim, why are you telling him, nah, you are the words of God, you should be? He didn't. Is Harry Potter the word of God? No. Why not? Because it makes no claims anywhere but it is. Right. We know that J.K. Rowling authored it. Right. And does she claim to be inspired by a spirit and this and that? <laughs> so there's no need for us to question it. No. Alhamdulillah. Do the New Testament authors claim they're inspired by God? Yes. Where? One of the I'm going to make it easy for you. No, they don't. You know what? The gospel authors themselves didn't even claim to be eyewitnesses. The preachers made all of that up. Read with me Luke 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us. Please focus. They were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the world. He is saying that the eyewitnesses handed this information to us. He is not saying he is an eyewitness. Continue reading. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. He is clearly saying that he was investigating the tales that he heard from those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning. Then the preacher will say, nah, he was an eyewitness. The guy is saying, I heard from the eyewitnesses, and you are saying, no, you are eyewitness. Gospel Titles and Authors The titles and authors given in the Gospels of the New Testament read in most Bibles in large, bold text. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of John. We as readers are led to assume, and some Bibles outright state, that these books were written by Jesus' disciples and direct eyewitnesses to the events they describe. Matthew being written by, well, Jesus' disciple Matthew, the former tax collector. John written by John, son of Zebedee. And in the case of Mark, a man connected with Peter. And Luke, named after a traveling companion mentioned by Paul in Colossians. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. As confirmed by early manuscripts of the documents themselves, originally, these Gospels were untitled and did not name any sort of author. 
They were written anonymously, and the authors, whoever they might have been, never wrote their names nor did they write in the first person or insert themselves into the narratives. This was no secret or even something that interested early Christians. It was likely assumed at the time that these texts were not written by the disciples or by anyone who had significance in Jesus' life. It's actually quite obvious that the disciples hadn't written these texts when one notes that they were written in Greek by educated Greek speakers, likely outside of Israel, maybe from Greece, Asia Minor, or Egypt. Literacy in the ancient world was rare. By modern estimates, at the best of times in antiquity, only about 10% or so of the population was able to read, and most of these were concentrated in urban areas like cities, and not in the type of areas where Jesus' disciples might have been from. Keep in mind, most of them were fishermen and hard laborers in the countryside. By all accounts, peasants. The ability to read is one thing. In the ancient world, it was another to be able to write and compose a literary work. Few people in the first and second centuries would have been able to produce something like the Gospels. The few there were would have been from eastern cities of the Roman Empire, like Alexandria. Most scholars agree that none of the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, and more likely to have been written by urban Christians who were recording oral and written traditions, sayings, and stories about Jesus and his life, passed down and compiling them in a unified text. The Gospels themselves are not apologetic about this. The Gospel of Matthew is written completely in the third person, using they to refer to the disciples, and never we. The tax collector turned disciple Matthew is never referred to as me, but instead just him. There is zero indication in the actual text that we are supposed to be led to believe this man also wrote what we are currently reading. Same thing with Luke and Mark. Moreover, if we apply the authentication guideline number two, remember it, the trustworthiness of the reporter. We agreed that the reporter should be known to be a righteous person, right? And should be known not to be a liar. When we were authenticating hadith, if someone was known to be a liar or at least lied one time in his life, that's it, his testimony was not accepted. If we apply that to one of the authors of the New Testament, let's say, for example, Paul, who wrote more than half of the New Testament, more than half of the book. Let's read what he said about himself. Romans 3.7 For if the truth of God has increased through my lie, for if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? The author himself admits to using lies to spread religion and claims that it is okay to lie. No wonder your preachers keep lying to you till today to spread Christianity. Moreover, where is the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch was very popular among early Christians. Why did they get rid of it suddenly? This book is referenced in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. How come you suddenly decide to remove a book and keep its references? At least if you remove it, remove the references. Moreover, most biblical scholars believe that the story of the adulterous woman in John 8 was not in the original text but was added later. Whoever added a full story to the gospel, did he really make an honest translation mistake? Like literally, it's an honest mistake. His, his pen, while he was writing, his pen slipped from him, you know? And when it was slipping on the paper, it wrote down a full made-up story from beginning to end. The honest mistake, just translation mistakes. Why did a man add a full story and claim it is words of God or perfect words of Jesus or whatever. Where did he get this story from? And why wasn't this story there from the beginning? Most of the time, scribes are just trying to copy a text and they'll make mistakes, like they'll misspell a word, they'll leave out a word, they'll leave out a line, they'll leave out a letter. Sometimes they'll add something. You don't normally get huge chunks of things changing radically. You do sometimes. The story of the woman taken in adultery in the Gospel of John was added on. It wasn't originally there. Mark's last 12 verses where Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection were not originally there. The doctrine of the Trinity that was inserted into 1 John chapter 5 was not originally there. So there are big things. 
Most of them are small things, but people come to realize is sometimes these small things really change everything. Moreover, why are there verses that exist in some manuscripts but do not exist in the others? Like literally full verses, full verses that change the meaning, just vanished. I will give you one example that will show the evidence that the NIV has twisted a verse. When you read Acts chapter 8, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. This verse 37 is not in the NIV. You know why? Because this verse destroys what happens in the Catholic Church. Okay. <laughs> so so, <laughs> I, I have no idea why you're laughing. Okay, look, what you've just done is you established to us even further how your book is corrupted. So if the NIV is a corrupted version of the Bible, then we have established corruption in the Bible because we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are reading the NIV every day as the word of God, believing that this is from the creator. So all of you done is you're laughing at yourself because you just established yourself that your book is corrupted because some quote unquote what you call translations have verses the others don't have them. In the end you will have to accept the fact that Christians only accept the Bible because the church said it is authentic. And the problem is when you ask them, why do you believe the church? They say, because the Bible says you should believe the church. See the circular reasoning? The reason you believe the Bible is the church, and the reason you believe the church is the Bible. I can do the same. It's a very good idea. I can write a text right now that says, this YouTube channel, Dean Academy, is reliable. Trust everything that they say. And then I tell you, I am saying that this text is authentic. You should trust it. Okay, deal? Then, when you look at me and ask me, why should I trust you? I tell you, because the text says so. The text says you should trust me. And then you ask me, why should I trust the text? I will tell you, because I said so. Circular reasoning. If I do it, it will sound ridiculous. But when the church does it, it becomes a faith for billions. Imagine just fabricating a text, claiming it's from God, and then make the text itself confirm your valid. And then write a verse that says, Tithing, give us 10% of your income. And then millions of people follow believe the text, believe the church, and give the church 10% of their income. And when 10% was not enough for the fat pope and preachers, they started selling indulgement parchments. Oh, you don't have enough good deeds? Okay, give us your money and we will sell you good deeds. We will sell you get out of hell certificates. But what proves that you have this power to sell get out of hell certificates? It is in the text, see, it says, believe the church but why should we believe the text because i said so and i am trustable why are you trustable because the text says you can find hundreds of similar errors and mistakes like these throughout the text that survived to us today but other changes as we will discuss in a second appear to have not been mere mistakes but intentional and motivated alterations to the text in some versions Verses, words, or entire passages have been added, subtracted, or changed beyond recognition. Scholars, both Christian, Jewish, agnostic, and atheist, often agree and recognize the evidence for such intentional changes. There are also other examples where the Greek text has said one thing, but later translators rendering the text into a different language have simply made their own versions of what the text should say to solve perceived contradictions. Other editions are just that wholly new additions that weren't part of the text at all. We don't claim that the Bible is eternal. No, we know it was written by men. We know that at one time when it was written down, it was complete. Has it been changed? Yes, we agree, it has been changed. After all of that, you go talk to a Christian, you find him claiming with confidence, saying, Jesus said this, Jesus did that. Where do you get this confidence from? The reality is, no one today really knows anything about Jesus. No one knows what he said or did. And if after all of what I said, you can't see that, then I can't really burst your bubble. You will have to live in your bubble of denial. 
nobody should expect for Christians to find the original Gospels. That's not going to happen. That's not how history or archaeology works when we're dealing with that time. This chart is misleading, by the way. That early 125 AD manuscript is smaller than a credit card. So, finding a manuscript 300 years later is not bad at all, though. So, what's the problem? The problem is this is supposed to be Christianity's main source of truth. So any corruption or manipulation in the text can impact truth. We already know that the Bible today has changes from this 4th century manuscript. But you have no oral tradition or chains of transmission of linking this manuscript to the original. And we also have no way of linking that original to Jesus. So the manuscript is all you have. Here, look. Here's my amazing artwork I want to share. This is by no means a 100% accurate representation, so please do not use this in your history report or anything. It's just meant to convey an idea. So you, you got Jesus. He teaches things to his original disciples. Christianity's four main gospels are attributed to disciples Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While each gospel has a separate story, I've kind of condensed everything here, which is why this artwork won't be completely accurate. Uh, then you got disciples teaching things to who knows, because we really have no idea. Then you have a mysterious Q manuscript, which Bible scholars say were used for the two of the four gospels as sources. And while Christian tradition claims the gospel writers directly got their info from the disciples, evidence suggests otherwise given they wholesale copied each other, even though these are supposed to be independent eyewitness accounts. Then there's a bunch more mystery going on between them and the Codex Sinaiticus we get to see, which has differences from today's Bible. So you see this? No names, personalities, or identifications are taking place at all after the disciples. You have a few papyruses or papyri, I don't know what the plural is. You have a few of those for a few chapters found in between. But overall, the Codex Sinaiticus is basically the best thing you have to rely on. Now, here's a problem that Christianity will run into. Take this verse, for example. Wow, so beautiful. Baptize them in the name of the all-star team. But what's this? The early church father, Eusebius, quotes this 18 times as, Make disciples of all the nations in my name. What's going on here? Changes? Okay, which one is true? Remember the oldest manuscript? That agrees with Eusebius, and not the current Bible today. There is no other church father you can point to with the current verse who says, Well, I have an unbroken chain of transmission going back to the guy who wrote Matthew. When comparing the Bible to the Quran in terms of manuscripts, we'll find something astounding. Since the Bible cannot be memorized, it only depends on manuscripts. And so, the New Testament, for example, depends on around 5,500 scrolls and parchments written in Greek. Can you guess how many manuscripts date back to the first century? Well, that would be 0%. In fact, around 85% of the New Testament is depending on manuscripts from the 11th to the 15th century. That is well over 1,000 years after they were written, and only 2% are from the 2nd to the 5th century. So every time they found a new manuscript throughout this thousand years, they updated their holy book. And that is why you get things like this. Joshua in his own book, Joshua 24:29 stating that he died at the age of 110. We've learned a lot about history in school, right? But you know what they never taught us? They never taught us that historians mostly make their theories based on what is plausible. They don't really base their theories on real proof. Most of history has not been well preserved. Usually what we get is the point of view of one ancient storyteller. Who can say the truth or who can lie? There is no way really to authenticate anything. For example, 
Historians claim that the big pyramid of Giza was built by King Khufu. Do you know why did they make that claim? The pyramid itself from inside doesn't have any writings or drawings. Like literally nothing. But when they were digging next to the pyramid, focus with me, next to the pyramid, not inside it, they found one miniature statue, like this one that you can see in the picture, it is as big as one hand, like a small statue. They found it somewhere next to the pyramid. It might have just fallen from someone, maybe there was a thief stealing something and it fell from him. That's they don't really care. They just want to make a theory and get it over with. So they pretended that this is evidence that the big pyramid that has no writing was built by King Khufu and then they shoved it in your history books and pretended this is scientific. And people, you know what, just believe. Then now after years, they are making another claim. They are saying, no, the pyramid was actually an electricity generator. Again, where is the proof? Basically, history is what historians want it to be. I will give you another example. When they found the writings of the priest Manitho, this guy claimed that the Hyksos were some barbaric tribes who invaded his country. After they taught us that in schools for a lot of years, turns out he was a liar. And the Hyksos were actually civilians of the same country he lived in. He just didn't like them. This is the problem of finding a random piece of paper and taking whatever is in it as a fact without validating the author first. This is why you really need Ilm al-Rijal. You really need the science of history authentication. Moreover, when you ask about the books of Aristotle, what is the proof that these books were really written by Aristotle? Maybe it was written by someone else who claimed to be Aristotle. You know when someone is famous, and his book sells. Someone can take advantage of that and write some books and sell them in the name of Aristotle, right? It's, it, it might happen. So what is the proof that these books are actually written by Aristotle? When I asked these questions to a lot of professionals, do you know what they said? They said, we have no evidence that it is fake. Therefore, we assume it's authentic. See the logic. I should prove it's fake. How should I prove? I don't know. You should prove it is authentic. You're the one making the claim it is authentic. You should prove your claim, not I prove you wrong. If I get a book and claim it's from God, I should prove that, not the opposite. Anyway, what I want to say is the bar of authenticity is very, very low. They would accept whatever is plausible, is possible. And they will present it to you in school as facts. And you just, you know, memorize whatever they tell you and put it in the exam paper. You know what? Even in archaeology. Remember Henry Fairfield? The famous paleontologist and the president, the president of the American Museum of Natural History? A man with this title is a very trustworthy source, right? He showed us how science finally, finally proved evolution and how they found fossils that prove the existence of this Nebraska man. See, he looks like half man and half ape, right? And check out his wife, she looks funny. Even facial details and hair and everything, they, they discovered everything. Science really proven evolution. Everything about this scientific publication proves without a shadow of a doubt that the whole story of humans evolving from apes is real. But there is one tiny problem though. Turns out, it was all made up. It was originally described on the basis of a tooth found. I'm not joking. He found a tooth and from this tooth, he made up everything else from his imagination. Of course, the atheists celebrated this fake evidence for years. Every time we talk to any one of them in a debate, they would say, Ah, oh, science proved the existence of Nebraska man. This man that he drew from his imagination. Imagine all of these details 
of the man and his wife came from just a tooth. And the fun part is, turns out the tooth belonged to a pig. Yes, to a pig. These discoveries revealed that the tooth was incorrectly identified. According to these discovered pieces, the tooth belonged neither to a man nor to an ape, but to a fossil to an extinct species of peccary. After this disgrace was exposed, they made up a new fake scientific discovery. You know, they have to keep it going with the whole evolution thing. So, the indisputable proof of our evolutionary ancestors. Reconstruction of Lucy, a fossil hominid dated to around 8 million years ago. See this fossil of your grandmother? It proves without a shadow of a doubt that you are the son of an ape. And they kept this lie going for 25 years. 25 years of people getting deluded that science proved that your grandmother looked like this. Until finally, in 1999, they finally admitted, oops, these bones belonged to some kind of monkey. And this picture of your grandmother is made up. They made it up. And here is the cover of Sites and V magazine saying, Adieu, Lucy. Translation, goodbye, Lucy. But think about that. Between the years 1974 and 1999, Lucy was taught in schools and in media as evidence of a false theory. They made millions of people become atheists based on a lie. And here is more evidence. Lucy was just an ape. Both anatomy and evolutionary disagreement has already debunked Lucy as any kind of human ancestor. The famous Lucy has long been an icon of evolution, portrayed in museums and textbooks as an upright walking ape woman dated to about 3.2 million years ago. Wasn't it 8 million years? Anyway. Now, over 40 years after her initial discovery in Ethiopia, paleontropologists have found that one of Lucy's bones does not actually belong to her, but to a baboon. Baboon. You know what? I will make a video later about these tens or maybe hundreds of made-up scientific evidences. Subscribe so you won't miss it. That's not our point now. Please don't write anything about evolution in the comments. Wait for the next video. What I want to focus now is that people really believe whatever they want to believe. And they reject whatever they want to reject. And my advice to you is ignore people. Just focus on yourself. If this becomes your criteria, believe whatever you want to and reject whatever you want to, you are basically choosing reality instead of learning about reality if you understand what I'm saying. You are choosing what facts are, and you live in a bubble of denial of any evidences presented to you as long as you don't like them. You are making your own little world inside your head and completely ignoring reality. I remember in one video before, I gave an example. I said, when I was in Dubai, the sun was very hot. I hated going outside. Of course, this is a fictional story. Then, one day, I decided that I don't believe in the sun. The sun doesn't exist. So in my head, there is no sun anymore. But when I went outside, it was still hot. Nothing changed. The whole idea that the sun doesn't exist was just something that I decided to believe. Because I liked it. It sounds fun if I decide that the sun doesn't exist. But the reality is... It existed and it was still hot. What you believe doesn't change anything. It's just a fake bubble of delusion in your head. Stop thinking about what you like and what you don't like and look for evidences. As you can see, the preservation of the Quran and Hadith is far, far superior than the preservation of anything in history and the preservation of any claimed scripture in the whole world. If you decide to claim that the Quran is corrupt or the Hadith is corrupt 
or they are not reliable to you, then you will have to reject also the stuff that are less authenticated. You will have to reject everything that has less evidence of preservation. Therefore, you will have to literally reject all human history and every other religion. Don't forget that I'm talking only about the preservation part. Whether it is from God or it is from the Prophet is another subject that, by the way, we talked about in detail in this playlist. If you want to answer to this question, click on the link in the description and watch the playlist and you will get exactly what you want. But now let's focus on the preservation. After all we talked about today, can someone please tell me how can you doubt the preservation of Hadith while believing anything about the history of Europe or Rome or China or whatever? How can anyone doubt the preservation of the Quran and Hadith and then believe the Bible as eyewitness accounts? How can anyone doubt the preservation of Quran and Hadith and believe anything else really? It's okay to doubt these two books, but don't be a hypocrite and also reject everything else. You should live in nihilism and pretend that nothing in the world exists. People believe whatever they want to believe, and they don't believe whatever they don't want to believe. Evidence doesn't really matter as long as it fits their desires, or at least doesn't annoy them. If it doesn't annoy me, I would take it. But when it comes to controlling my desires and restricting my freedom, no, I need 110% evidence. Well, here you are. Now, don't let your emotions force you into a quick decision. I know you might have heard a lot of information in this video for the first time in your life. Go back from the beginning of the video and Google every point that I said that you doubt. Make sure that all of them are indeed facts. And always remember that arrogance is blindness. Don't forget to check our playlist, Dismantling Christianity. I am sure it will change your perspective forever. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and share. Thanks, and before you go, listen to some Quran with me. Salam alaykum. إن المجرمين في عذاب جهنم خالدون لا يفتر عنهم وهم في مبلسون إن المجرمين في عذاب جهنم خالدون لقد جئناكم بالحق ولكن أكثركم للحق كارهون أم أبرموا أمرا فإنا مبرمون أم يحسبون أنا لا نسمع سرهم ونجواهم 
أم يحسبون أنا لا نسمع سرهم ونجواهم بلى بلى ورسلنا لديهم يكتبون قل إن كان للرحمن ولد فأنا أول العابدين سبحان رب السماوات والأرض سبحان رب السماوات والأرض قل إن كان للرحمن ولد فأنا أول العابدين سبحان رب السماوات والأرض رب العرش عما يصفون فذرهم يخوضوا ويلعبوا فذرهم يخوضوا السماوات والأرض وتبارك الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض وما بينهما وعنده علم الساعة وإليه ترجعون ولا يملك الذين يدعون من دونه الشفاعة إلا من شهد بالحق وهم يعلمون ولئن سألتهم من خلقهم لا يقولن الله فأنا يؤفكون وقيله يا رب إنها فاصفح عنهم وقل سلام فسوف 